designs up there on the screen. I didn't have the heart to tell them, well, that's all the pixels that are dying a uh, hundred at a time each week, you know. So, but anyway, uh, we finally got that replaced, and they lined this one up to a little bit better and everything, so uh, we're starting all fresh and new today. Uh, the food pantry is going to be open for curbside delivery. How about that? It's another term that's been added to our lexicon here in the last three months. Uh, this next Saturday, the 30th, from 11 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. So they'll be bringing the groceries to the cars when people uh, come up. And we've been ministering to a lot of folks up until this time that this happens. So, you know, one Easter morning, Easter Sunday morning, a little boy took off his, his clip, clip on top, and he tossed it in the offering plate whenever it went by. And his mother says, what are you doing? That's brand new. We just got that for Easter. He replied innocently, Mama, the pastor said it, it's time to give our tithes and our offerings. <laughs> Y'all remember when you were little, sometimes you misunderstood some things that were, were being said or sung in songs, you know. Well, I want to thank all of you that have been uh, so faithful to continue to give your tithes and your offerings through this time. And, uh, those of you that are at home that have been sending those in as well. Now, we're continuing to not hand out bulletins for a while. Today, normally, on Memorial Day weekend, we can do the Lord's Supper. And we had thought about that, and Nancy reminded me, and Ryan, last Sunday. She said, you know, we're, we're not passing the plates. We're not. I said, you're right. We'll, we're going to get that as soon as we possibly can. And, of course, the offering plate is located at the back of the room where we've had it for the last couple of months. Uh, in case you didn't hear earlier, uh, what we're doing uh, for a smoother live stream, I mean, We've had Windstream out four times in the last month, replacing things, doing things. We got a new modem, new wires run. They checked all the wires outside. They did find a couple that had been fried by a squirrel. Well, I had fried squirrel once. It wasn't that bad. Not as much meat on it as a chicken. But still, uh, it still needs to be fresh, though. You need to find it fresh. Uh, but anyway, they said, okay, here's what's going on. We're pretty positive. Uh, he says, whenever everybody's on the Wi-Fi for the church. If you're not on the guest Wi-Fi, if you're on the regular Wi-Fi, on your phone, if you're doing your Bible, so he says the more people you have on that, it's like nine or ten people gathering around the same drinking fountain. So it's drawing down the power that uh, Mallory's using back there, so we get the little hiccups in the recording. So they've asked that we you know, disconnect from the Wi-Fi, or turn the phone off, or whatever. Now if you have your Bible on your phone, or whatever, if you haven't already got it memorized, uh, he says, you can go to guest. You know, you can go to first FPC Wayne guest. And I think that the password is guest. Mm -hmm. So you can go on there with that. So, all right. I'm going to ask Jim if he would pray for us. And, of course, pray for our nation as we continue to worship. And the Father, we just thank you for our country, Lord. Thank you for those who came before us, our ancestors, Lord. Lord, our country is based upon your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for everything you give us every day. We have so much food, clothing, places to live, Lord. We just thank you for all of those things. You've been so kind to us. Uh, Lord, we do this morning pray for our nation. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that we would come through this time of crisis well we pray for it. the virus would to the society go away. We pray Lord if anything that it brings us closer to you. Yes. Lord we do pray for those that are our church Lord that are experiencing illness. Uh, just pray that you feel that we're all there close to you. Give them comfort. We pray Lord Rick as he delivers this message this morning. Uh, that you would bless it. Lord, and, uh, the Holy Spirit would be working uh, in our congregation and those who are watching. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe I've shared this before, but uh, it's worth saying again. Uh, have you ever wondered why? We, when we sing songs like the hymn we're about to sing, Holy, 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 have you ever wondered 
Why do we sing the word holy three times? Because in Hebrew, which is the language that the Old Testament was written in, there is no way to express what in English we call the comparative and the superlative, such as tall, taller, tallest. This is how the Hebrews do it. Tall, 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 tall. So now you get it. Holy, 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 holy. <clears throat> so let's sing that together as we exalt our God who is the holiest of them all.
thank the Lord for waking you up this morning. Amen. You know, I, I try so hard when I go to bed at night, when I wake up in the morning, to thank you. you know, to pray to him. Appreciate it for the breath in our lungs. Everything. Everything we have is from him. All good and perfect gifts come from the Father of life. The whole world owes him every breath. And think how many do not give him the time of day. He causes the sun to shine on the saved and the lost, the rain to fall, the saved and the lost. Yeah, we've been having so many issues with our technology lately because you know, there's no great mystery. I mean, we're trying to get the gospel out. You know, so Satan is going to do whatever. He's the prince of the power of the air is what, you know, is what the, the Lord calls him, you know, what the scriptures call him. So, you know, he can, I, I say, throw this in your prayer. Pray for our technology. Pray that he doesn't get into the, you know, gremlins don't get into stuff whenever we're trying to, to do the services and dis, distract, you know. Technology is both a great blessing and a great burden. Sometimes it's just a pain to the older generation. I know some of the young people smile and probably just shake their heads, you know, whenever they're talking about things I don't understand. Maybe we don't know how to tweet and Twitter, but I grew up thinking those words were sounds birds and bugs made. You know? Now, we know how to change oil in our own car. And I'll tell you what, uh, I know how to fry chicken and homemade mashed potatoes and gravy. You know, we're doing that a little bit later today at our house. Some of you might want to know when. We know what a party line is and how it worked. How many of y'all remember the party line? Yeah, yeah, remember that? Uh, we know how to cool an entire house with no air conditioner and one fan. You just ask some of the old ones. We can tell you how to do it. We did it growing up, didn't we, Dad? That's right, we put that one fan. Of course, he got an air conditioner after we moved off to college. <laughs> and then after I left Oklahoma Baptist University, they air conditioned the door. Didn't do that while I was there. Mm. But I digress. You know, we know how to do that. We know how to defrost a refrigerator. We grew up with the real meaning of the Board of Education. We knew what that meant. Today, we can't get two feet from our cell phones or, or we start to Twitter. We start to, to twitch a little bit, you know. And if the battery on our, our phone is, is dead, we panic about who or what we're missing. I've shared this before. I was standing outside of a movie theater a few years back that had some teenage vampire movie on, you know, and that movie let out this for the movie I was going to go in, so I'm standing out there waiting for the thundering herd to pass. 200 teenagers were pouring out, and every one of them was doing what? They had their phones. They were looking at their phones. They were punching letters on their phone, or they were talking on their phone. They couldn't see where they were walking. They were stumbling to each other. They were bumping into trash cans and door jams. But they had to find out what they were missing. They had to get on there. Some of us have holsters for our phones. We might find ourselves forced to be in a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody. But if that telephone goes, oh, wait a minute, you know, we got we're pretty quick on the draw, even in our old age. I find myself trying to type out a long text, you know, with these fat little fingers, you know, just trying to. I'm texting and texting and I'm texting to somebody who has a cell phone. I say, why don't I just call them? It'd be so much easier, don't you think? I've been doing all that. Oh my goodness. While we were doing a, a revival in Arkansas one time, uh, my, my phone's GPS led me and Ryan to what we were looking for a, a, a local a chicken restaurant that they had that was well known and it, it led us to what looked more like a meth lab. <laughs> and I said, Rod, I don't think this is where we were supposed to go. It says we're the ride. I mean, there's a few fried fillets on the front lawn, but there's no fried chicken anywhere <laughs> close by. With all these new technological devices and gadgets that we're supposed to make our lives easier and save us time, I've never seen so many frustrated people. So many frustrated folks today. And all that pressure seems to show up most within the home. It's often released with destructive force. I mean, our loving Heavenly Father gave us a plan to deal with the restlessness in our homes. And if we pay close attention, we can all learn something wonderful today. I've been sharing for three weeks God's top ten. And these ten commandments relate directly to our homes. There used to be a time when a man came home from work 
and he set down his lunchbox. I remember Dad with his lunchbox. You know, some of you, you know, and you said, boy, it's good to be home. It's a rat race out there. You know, but today the rat race is in the house. And God has a cure for that. It's, it's something we need to take very, very seriously. More seriously than the media or some political people would have you believe. Remember, as it goes to home, so it goes to America. Now here it is. God has given us a day of rest. All right? Many of us don't use it. Many don't know much about it. But a great title of today's message could be how to make the, the rest day the best day. In Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, I sent this out to, to you yesterday. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your manservant or maidservant nor your animals nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now don't get ahead of me. Okay? Some of your minds are already churning because you're just brilliant. You're just amazing creatures. But have you ever stopped for a moment to think that a God so incredibly awesome and powerful, unlimited in power, as to be able to make the whole universe in six days, probably could have just spoken into existence in a, in a second, in a nanosecond. He could have, he took six days. Why six days? I believe God was all about making the examples for us to follow. You know? He gave us marriage as an example of a relationship building and a picture of the relationship he desires to have with us. And if that wasn't enough, he gave us kids to make our relationship with him even stronger through continual prayer. <laughs> I love books with pictures, don't you? I love them. Uh, they help me understand what the words are saying and to stay focused. We had a picture Bible with the stories we used to teach the girls each night when they were small. A lot like this one. This isn't the one. This one's done in almost comic book form, you know, except everybody's real serious in this one. You know, I encourage you to come up and look at that after the service. But we had those pictures uh, that we could show uh, the girls to help bring things to light. In fact, after Nancy's dad got saved, he used that same, very same Bible to teach the girls. And he was a new Christian, and he was learning turning the pages and looking at the pictures and reading with them while he was teaching them at night at bedtime. Same Bible. You know, Jesus' whole life on earth was a continual picture. A constant picture from the way he treated others to washing his disciples' feet. It was a picture. Jesus, above all people, he didn't need to be baptized. But he insisted that John baptize him as an example for us to follow. So God worked six days in making the world and he rested on the seventh as if God really needed six days or even if he needed real, real rest. But you and I aren't God. So he gave us a picture to observe and to follow. Now our day of rest is a wonderful gift. I mean Jesus told us in Mark 2.27 that the Sabbath was made what? For man. It was made for us. In fact, all of God's commandments, you've heard me say this now, this is the fourth time, they were made for our benefit to enhance our lives and our existence, to make them better. When we honor God by keeping His commands, listen, He hasn't made one bit holier. But you and I, it's us, we become more like our holy God when we obey His commands. We, be, we begin to take on His holiness and His family resemblance, so to speak. Remember that when God says, Thou shalt not, He's saying, now don't hurt yourself. And when he's saying, thou shalt, he, he's saying, help yourself to this happiness that I've provided for you. Now listen carefully. Though God gave the Sabbath to Israel, he's given you and I something far better. He's given us the Lord's Day. Okay, so stay with me. The Lord's Day is the transformation of the Sabbath, the Old Testament Sabbath, into something even more wonderful. It is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Jesus was the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. And, and this now is the fulfillment of the Sabbath, what we have in the Lord's Day. And if we use this gift from God as He intended, it could be one of the greatest treasures within the, the list of family values that we have. 
The very word Sabbath means rest. And there are three days of rest that the Bible talks about. You might want to write these down, something to think about, and you're going to see how they make sense. There's creation rest. Number two is covenant rest. And number three is Calvary rest. First there's creation rest. Genesis 2, 2 to 3 says, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So God ceased his work of creation, uh, enjoying the fellowship with what he had made. Us. But something interrupted his rest. What was it? Our sin. Our sin interrupted his rest. In John 5, 17, Jesus had just healed a man on the Sabbath day. Remember, all sickness and disease comes from what? Our sin. It's been allowed to come into this world because of our sin. When the, when, whenever everything fell, when the world fell, but Jesus, who is God in the flesh, he worked to heal this man on the Sabbath. Completely healed him, even though it was technically the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees, the religious dudes, you know, they saw this and they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath law. Can you imagine looking at somebody, every single little detail of their life, and trying to find problems or uh, something wrong with it? Do we have anything like that going on today? No, I'm sure we do. No. Doesn't matter if you're doing good. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Anyway, I'll leave that alone. Listen to what Jesus said to them. My father is always at work to this very day. And I, too, am working. You think they understood what he was saying? Remember, the creation rest pertained only to God himself. And sin had interrupted that rest. And so God began to work again to bring about restoration. To bring about that, restore that relationship that had been broken by our sin. And then there's covenant rest. Covenant rest. What's another word for covenant an agreement, a testament. Yeah. This pertains to the nation of Israel. I mean, God had a special people in Israel, so he gave them this special day, the Sabbath, the last day of the week, technically Saturday, uh, as a day of rest. Now, so here are some of the verses that pertain to this. Exodus 31, 13. Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Exodus 31, 16. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant or agreement. You see, it was a covenant Sabbath. It was agreement, a sign between God and his people in the Old Testament of what was still to come, what is still down the road. There are, there are people today, and you've probably met them, who want to keep the Sabbath like they did in the Old Testament. But you have to be very, very careful if, you, if you're going to do that for to break the Sabbath in the Old Testament make sure and sudden death. There are people who want to keep it today. But you know, you're going to get in trouble if you try to do that. Look back in the same passage we just read in, in, Exodus, in verse 15 of Exodus 31. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day must be what? Put to death. So if you did something as simple as building a fire to make a meal and keep warm, technically you could be put to death. So you tell those folks, uh, how, how much do you keep the Sabbath? You who say we have to keep the Sabbath. We're, we're breaking God's law and all that. Uh, Mallory uh, texted yesterday because she was reading the message ahead of time and put it in. And so she sent me, she says, oh, I can be put to death. For working on the Sabbath, she hadn't read the whole thing yet. But I see this verse, I can be put to death. Uh, I wonder if I could try that with my boss. You know, and I said, oh, my, my religious uh, uh, beliefs are such that, you know, I, I can't work on, on, on the Sabbath. I can't work on Sunday. I said, well, they might relieve you of all your responsibility <laughs> if you try that. You know. Exodus 35, 3. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Now, if you insist on keeping the Sabbath as they did that day, you got trouble. How many of you started your car or truck this morning to come here? Maybe how many cylinders you have, you lit that many fires. <laughs> Technically, and believe me, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have counted that. Every one of those, they would count your cylinders. 
If you turned on a kitchen stove, or you turned on a light, technically you started a fire. If you took a hot shower this morning, I pray you all did. There's a fire somewhere, you know, to get that hot water. The Old Testament Sabbath was between God and Israel when there was a theocracy. God was their sole king. God was their lawgiver. There are 39 words in this commandment in the Hebrew language that talks about the Sabbath. And the Jews took it upon themselves to add to the Word of God, finding 39 ways that you could break the Sabbath. But that wasn't enough for them. Trying to show just how righteous they could be and studious in the Word of God, the Jews took each of those 39 ways to break the Sabbath, and they broke them down into 39 ways you could break each of the 39. They had 1,521 ways you could break the Sabbath. You think the Sabbath was a joy for most Jews by this time? Can't do anything. Jesus told the Pharisees in Mark 7, 8, you have let go of the commands of God and you're holding on to the traditions of men. This has nothing to do with what God originally intended. The Pharisees taught that if you have a tack in your shoe, you better take it out on Friday night or you'd be guilty of carrying something on the Sabbath. If you had a flea or a tick on you, you better get him off on Friday. If you go after him on the Sabbath, you are guilty of hunting. <laughs> hunting on the Sabbath, oh yeah. They would not eat an egg that was laid fresh by a hen on the Saturday of the Sabbath. Because that hen had worked to make that egg. Now you could swallow a spoonful of vinegar with your meal on the Sabbath. But if you had a toothache, you know, that sometimes that vinegar, that's what they would use to help with a toothache, you better not hold that in your mouth. You better not hold that vinegar in your mouth for one extra second too long to help with that toothache, because if you do, you're, you're guilty of healing. That's how ridiculous. This is the political links the Pharisees had stretched the command of God to simply rest on the Sabbath. And they hated Jesus. They hated Him because He was pointing out their silly Sabbath laws. And he was not only that, he was rebuking them in front of the people. And the people loved him for it. Didn't matter to the Pharisees that Jesus was actually healing somebody. I mean, that should have been enough to take anybody's breath away and cause them to fall on their face in front of him and worship him. But they hated him so much and they were so blinded. Their, their minds had been given over to Satan to the point that they overlooked that and criticized him further while he's doing works of love, compassion, and mercy. And some here may see a similar picture in today's political saying, uh, setting, I'm just saying. So there was a creation rest. And when God ceased his labor of creation, men interrupted that. Then there was a covenant rest when God gave Israel a great gift of a day of rest, but they contorted it and they made it and what was meant to be a blessing, a burden. So here's the third rest, the one that applies to you and me. Okay, Remember that the word Sabbath means rest or to cease from working. Calvary rest. Calvary rest. This is the fulfillment of the Sabbath for us. And it's how we apply this particular commandment today. The Old Testament Sabbath, with all the Old Testament ceremonies, the sacrifices, uh, they were prophecies, they were pictures of something even more wonderful that was to come. Remember all those animals that were being sacrificed? Now, that was a picture. That blood couldn't really cover our sin, but it was a picture of the one, the, the Lamb of God, whose blood would take away the sins of the world once and for all down the road. So they're pictures. Jesus Christ would one day be our high priest who would make a sacrifice of himself once and for all. Amen? Amen. Now you remember, God rested after his first creation. When did Jesus rest? after his new creation was finished. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Remember that Jesus said he was working, remember? He says, my father's at work and I am at work. It's like my father is at work. He also said in, in John 9, 4, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Jesus came to work and to create a new creation. And when he was breathing his last on the cross, remember what his final words were? It is finished. It is finished. Work is 
done. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 12, that when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, as when he had finished his work, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now listen, in the Old Testament, you would not find a seat in the temple where the sacrifices were being done. You wouldn't find a seat anywhere because the priests were never allowed to sit because their work was never done. There were always more sacrifices to be offered. Always, always. But Jesus finished his work, sacrificing himself, and now he sits next to the Father. And here's what else Jesus did for us when he died in our place in Colossians 2.14. Colossians 2.14, it says, Having canceled the written code with all its regulations, all that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it all away, nailing it to the cross. Amen. You know, I used to sing a, a song, uh, listen to the hammer ring. He took all that was against us and he nailed it to his cross. You see, back in the time that the Bible was being written down, if a, a man committed a crime, and he was found guilty. The court clerk would write down those crimes and he'd nail that list, that debt of crimes to the prison door outside of the cell where that man was. And it remained there until he had paid his debt and was set free. It was called the certificate of debt. Jesus took our certificate of debt. He took our sins. He blotted them out. Essentially stamping out across that list of sins. It is finished. It is paid in full. He paid a debt. He did not owe. He used, the ink he used was his own blood. Verse 15 says that Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Satan and the Pharisees, they thought they won a great victory when Jesus died that day on the cross. But in reality, it was their biggest defeat. Verses 16 and 17. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you. Listen to this. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to any religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow. They are a picture of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Coming events, they cast a shadow for them. The Sabbath days were just a shadow of what was coming in Christ on the cross. So, what's the real meaning? The shadow on the floor or me? I've seen dogs chase shadows, and maybe you have too. You know, dogs chasing shadows. And, and do they ever catch it? No. Because it's not anything of substance. Jesus is the real thing. And, and the Sabbath of the Old Testament was only his shadow. People who try to live by all those rules and the regulations, they're not going to be able to do it. Remember the Ten Commandments? Are they a picture of this is what you got to do to go to heaven? They're just a standard showing us we can't keep them. They are a standard of God's holiness showing us that we need a Savior. It's called legalism. You think by keeping all the rules, the regulations, you're making God happy and He's going to let you into heaven. And you're in for a cruel shock because no one's ever going to catch heaven that way. They're like the dog trying to catch the shadow. It's not going to happen. But Jesus cried out in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'm going to give you what? Rest. I am your rest, your new creation. Your sin debt is paid in full. As the song says, it's just Jesus, nothing more. This is why we celebrate the first day of the week, because... Jesus burst forth from the grave, hallelujah, on the first day of the week. In Revelation 1.10, it's called the Lord's Day. The Old Testament Sabbath is never called the Lord's Day. Okay? But the new creation, Calvary Sabbath, it's called the Lord's Day. Jesus rose, first day of the week. He, he very often appeared to his followers, if you check the scriptures, on the first day of the week. And he even commissioned his followers to go preach to all nations on the first day of the week. In John 20, verse 21. The Holy Spirit was given to the church on the first day of the week in John 20, 22. The church was born on the first day of the week because Pentecost was on the first day of the week in Acts 2, verse 1. The early church met often on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of the week, the people gave of their offerings to the Lord. So quickly, 
wrapping this up. What are the rules, Brother Rick, concerning Sunday? The first day of the week. I tell you, I wish I could tell you. But the Bible doesn't really give us a whole list of, of rules to follow. Because the Sabbath was made for us. The Lord's Day made for us. Just, just be careful not to try to impose the Old Testament Sabbath rules on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. Because you're going to find yourself breaking those laws, those rules, every time you turn around. Let me get something clear to you. I want everybody thinking, so we're just jettisoning the fourth commandment? <laughs> no, we're not. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. We simply see it in its fulfillment today in Christ as it applies to the church today. Is it a holy day? Absolutely. Because it's the Lord's day. But God intended it to, to be a day of love, not legalism. Jesus said the day was made for our benefit, not to be a burden. Okay, uh, Brother Rick, is it okay to watch TV, go out to eat, go to a ball game, uh, go out on the boat, play ball, go visit the family? Hey, those are all good questions, and you'd probably come up with some more. Problem is, you're asking the wrong fellow. You'd be asking the Lord about it, about your relationship with Him. It's not my day, it's the Lord's day. This day is to be different from other days. Ask him, Lord, how can I honor you today? What can I do to make this day different? How can my family and I best honor you so that at the end of this day, we can know it was your day? When we keep the Lord's day, we honor the Lord and his word that says in Hebrews 10.25, listen, this is something you can't jettison. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I know we've been in some unusual circumstances here, but you know what I'm talking about. The Lord's Day is time out from God, or for God from a very busy life. We don't take time out for God. <laughs> That's out there now, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody could edit that. Look what Brother Rick said. Take time out from God. <laughs> take time to worship the Lord on this day. Father's one of the best things you can do for your family is to make uh, church attendance a regular habit. Because little eyes and ears are watching. They're listening to see what's most important to you. They're watching. More important than your work on Monday is your worship on Sunday. Okay? You know, sometimes we insult God's intelligence. Uh, I was joking about what Mallory said earlier, but just try this on your employer. You know, I didn't come in to work Monday because I had an unexpected company drop by. I knew you'd understand. Or, I was just so tired I slept in this morning, boss. That's okay, right? Things have been so busy, but we just haven't had a family day in a long time, so we all went to the lake. You know, when we miss church but not work, what are we telling our children? What's more important? We're showing them in our life. And they see that. Okay? Ouch! Show them that God is important, even when it isn't easy or convenient. Start getting ready for Sunday on Saturday night. The husbands, help in getting everything ready. I remember, you know, uh, uh, sometimes Randy and I, not Robin, because Robin's an angel. <laughs> sometimes Randy and I would move a little bit slow and... And, you know, we weren't all that excited and all out going, you know, when all our friends are going to be waiting for us to play ball and have to wait until after we get home at lunch. Ah, it's going to be late and hot in the afternoon. And mom said, come on, we got to go to church. So we changed that whenever our girls were little. Uh, we start dancing around. Going, we we to go to church today. You know, the girls would start dancing with us. And they got all excited about it. We made it a positive thing. It's a positive thing. Lay out the dresses, lay out everything, you know. Have a nice breakfast. Pray for the service. Be positive. Speak well of the church before your children. Don't go home from church and have roast preacher or roast deacon or roast music director. Let your children see you sing. Let them see you taking notes, making church attendance a happy time, a productive time. Take some time to rest on the Lord's Day. Take a nap, amen? Oh, last Sunday afternoon I took a nap, two and a half hours. The first time, and I cannot remember. And I woke up, and I hollered into Nancy. I was in the front den, and she was in the back den. I hollered, 
That was wonderful! <laughs> you know, it was so rare. It was fantastic. It was memorable. Oh, my goodness. There was a French philosopher who said, I have so much to do, I must go to bed. You know, if your ox, remember how Jesus refers to if your ox falls, keeps falling in the ditch on Sunday, kill the ox or fill in the ditch. <laughs> Fix the problem. Arrange your day so that it's different from other days in some, in some ways. And it can be the Lord's day. You'll do more in six days if you rest than you can do in seven without resting. I know companies and you know companies run by Christian people who are very successful and their owners have become billionaires. God has blessed them and they're closed on Sunday. And they get more done. And those companies are very often singled out in the media. You know, and they're, they're trying to find something wrong with them. You'll have more money to spend with nine-tenths having God as a partner than you will saying, I can handle all my money by myself, God. Amen. Take this day for music and family and fellowship and rest. Read a good book. Take that nap. Be inspired in the house of the Lord and be refreshed to begin the work week. Amen? Amen. Make the rest day the best day. Our sin debt's been paid in full by the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Uh, as the team comes, listen, you and I have been set free from the penalty, from the bondage of sin. That's another reason we should be able to wake up with a smile in the morning and say, man, I have a life that's, that's worth living. Lord, thank you. Now I have the breath of my lungs and for the bacon and the eggs I'm going to have here in a little while. But Lord, but I have a life of purpose and meaning. Hallelujah. Thank you. I don't have to worry all the time and just hope I'm going to make it to heaven someday that the good's going to outweigh the bad that I've kept enough of those regulations. No. That was covered by Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Hallelujah. I hope you believe that. Come to Jesus. He will give you the rest if you would bow with me. Maybe you're here and you don't have Jesus. You don't have that assurity in your life. Maybe you're watching somewhere either right now or you're watching, you're watching this a little bit later. Uh, but I'll tell you what. If you need to know for certain that you're going to heaven someday and that you can have a life worth living here on this earth, 